Well, once again, here we are on the podcast, listeners. We have the opportunity today to sit down with a South African legend who's played over 634 games professionally in the South African circuit, scored 58 goals, uh, played for some of the giants in South Africa in regards to Durban City, Amazulu, and Kaiser Chiefs. Also not just played, but managed at some of the biggest teams in South Africa. Mamelodi Sundowns on two occasions, and Amazulu as well. We are fortunate today to have what with us Mr. Neil Tovey. Mr. Neil Tovey, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's not every day that we get to talk to a legend, um, and, and, and I don't use the word loosely, uh, but we want to very quickly just get into it. It's over 25 years that uh, the African Nations Cup 96 winning team celebrated that momentous moment. And I'm sure you've been asked many times about the achievements of that team. But I don't know if you could just take us back because we are supporters. We are never in the change room. We are never in the hotel the days before the game. What was the build up like for that momentous game? Yeah, first I must just say, um, it's a sad time that it's been 25 years ago and, and we haven't won it since, but uh, you know, that maybe also we did not realize at the time the magnitude of, of our victory. You know, you thought, okay, we, we quite newbies into international football and success comes within the first four years. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a huge achievement. And obviously, as you say, 25 years later, that's only when we realize uh, how really difficult it is and was to to win that trophy coming to within the team dynamics yeah you know we were we were very fortunate that we had a number of good characters and we had you know a complete team and, and squad and it's not about the 11 players that go onto the field it's never is as you know it's it's about uh, off the field how we can we can gel together build the spirit up together um uh, you know, uh, how we train, we train like we played. It was very, very intense. In fact, hugely intense. And I suppose that because you've got to realize that players are trying to, to get into the team, into the starting 11, uh, and, and the other guys trying to stay in the starting 11. So whilst it always looked like a cut and dried uh, starting 11 bar one or two, it never quite was that, that that sort of easy come, easy go for, for the players that were part of that starting eleven, And uh, we had to keep our wits above us, about us, with regards to, uh, to keeping our performances of, of the caliber that, that we knew we could. The dynamics of the team, a lot of leaders, a lot of good, good individuals, uh, all round, uh, the, probably what was our best dynamic that we had. We had guys, we had tall guys, short guys, quick guys, quick thinking guys, all that you need in the makeup of, of, of a very, very successful team. And guys that could, if and when it wasn't quite going according to plan, could then adjust the game plan and, and do it on the field and not just look to uh, the dynamics of the, the coaching staff to, to try to give an instruction. We, we were able to think on our feet and I think that's one of the, the biggest attributes I think that team had that we had a lot of players that could change the game at any given time. Neil it's it's been a long time since I've seen you maybe 10 years I've got older you still look amazing I want to know <laughs> the secrets to your um to your um you know fountain of youth um but um I'm so deceiving eh? <laughs> maybe there's a falter on zoom right um <laughs> but um but Neil, um, jokes aside, it's great to see you. The last time I interviewed you, you were on the sidelines of, uh, of Amazulu, uh, doing a great cool. job with the coach. And I was at Inu, so it's been a long time. So it's good to see yeah. you, yeah. even though we're miles away. Um, but one of the things when we look at the AFCON success in 96, and, you know, South Africa, when we came out of apartheid, had so many highlights. You had the cricket thing, team doing great things on the field. You had the 95 um, Rugby World Cup winners. But I would argue the team of the people was the 1996 AFCON winners. There was a team that was 
uh, demographically very well represented of South Africa, on merit performing on the field. Um, and you had a team that was loved by the people and you had Nelson Mandela giving you his blessings everywhere you went. It was a little unfair who you played. What was it like having the 12th man and maybe Madiba's magic being the 13th man for that tournament? Yeah, you need uh, those kind of, uh, what can I say, help, <laughs> help uh, in every single way. Yeah, you know, the momentum, we were a team that was starting to gain momentum just prior to the tournament. It wasn't just in the tournament. We, we had played a Four Nations tournament, won that, played against Argentina, drew against Argentina, you know, <laughs> which is no mean feat, uh, drew with Germany 0-0. No, no. So we were gaining momentum already, uh, but hadn't really totally captured, uh, as you said, the, the, the every South African's sort of uh, uh, vision or, or, or hadn't captured their, their, uh, their thought process about the team. And, and then getting to know the team by the nicknames and, you know, the, as, as household names and, uh, and what that, that, that uh, sort of, what was it, six weeks, four to six weeks uh, period that, that was, was enormous for the country. We, we knew what, and I was at the Rugby Cup final uh, when they won and saw what that did for, for the nation. But then, as you said, it was only, what did I say, 5%, 10%. Of, of the real real feeling of, of the country you know and and that alone was 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 enormous and a goodwill goodwill at a, at a very uh, 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 timing was 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 excellent <clears throat> and we felt ourselves that we could even lift it more um, as you said once uh, the, the the tournament got started and the momentum gained then everybody in the country set up if you're a farmer in the northern Karoo, they were they were knowing about Bafana Bafana, and 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 that's how it worked. And uh, you know, and Neil was Neil even in Peter Maritzburg, they knew about Bafana Bafana. <laughs> that place, they know nothing. They know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so this, this, the Durban Maritzburg thing, I tell you about again now. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right on the outskirts of Peter Maritzburg. Eh? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but the Madiba factor, the Madiba factor was was a huge factor. You know, um, at any given time, he'd give me a call, uh, have a chat with me, where he, where he could not visit the camp or visit one of our uh, attend one of our games. He, he would give me a call most mornings uh, during the week, just just to chat and ask. What, what did he say to you, Neil? I mean, this is like the greatest statesman, arguably, that's ever lived, certainly in South Africa. And you're getting phone calls from him. I want to know what he's telling you. Yeah, look, I mean, he, he was always down to earth. You know, whenever you, you spoke to him, it, it wasn't always about the sudden sub subject of football. I mean, he would ask me, you know, how's the family and how's things going first and soften it up? How's the team? Uh, as a team, you know, uh, don't put pressure on ourselves and, you know, just just relax and do what we're good at and, and, and enjoy the 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 momentum that that it was creating for the country and he was ever so thankful for because he was obviously you know he was in his early days of of democracy and um he was ever so thankful for for this this kind of support and help that uh, that the government were getting from from the sporting codes and he always reiterated you know that that sport was always the the the, uh, the has ability to ignite uh, the, the 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 whole aspect about getting people to to love one another and to accept one another and to see one another as not enemy uh, and and he was always always so so grateful for that and then obviously got onto the subject of the football you know. <clears throat> If there was moments in the game and you know, shoes' ability and Doc's ability and yeah, you know, just just chat normally and but always you know uh, always there to chat always always there to chat. Neil, I wanna I wanna come back. You mentioned a bit earlier about big moments. Um, the semi final against Ghana, I think it was the semi final. Yeah. Uh, Lucas Radeba comes back in after a cruciate ligament injury. 
to play against at that time one of the most feared strikers in England, the the gargantuan Tony Yeboa, who was hitting yeah. goals left, right, and centre, and not just goals, outstanding world class goals. Yeah. Uh, the nation was fearful of Lucas coming back from this injury, partnering yourself in defence. Mm. Uh, and then you guys go and put a display like that in that game. Honestly, shoes being world class. What can you remember about that game specifically? Yeah, look, I mean, at that stage, we we felt that it was probably going to be our cup final um, in a sense that they were top, top uh, opposition. As you, I mean, you spoke about Tony De Boer. You know, they had Betty Pele, although thankfully he, he was out for that match. You know, and they had a lot, a lot of top players with great ability to hurt us. And, and, but as you say, fortunately, you know, we had to, we had to weather, weather the storm, uh, the opening storm, because we knew that they're going to come at us. And, and uh, Lucas did that with, with utmost uh, dedication. And, and because, you know, when you've got rivalry on the training field back home in England, the last thing you when you want to go back to your club and for your is for Tony to say, hey, we, we beat you, you know. So the bragging rights were so so important. And uh, so, but as you say, from a display, it was complete. Um, it was one or two jittery moments, I think, in the first 10, 12, uh, 12 minutes. But other than that, when we after we scored the first goal, we were in total sort of control of where we wanted to be uh, in that match. And nullifying their, their, their dangers from, from the left side of defense coming and overlapping, which was, which was important that we shift the dock across to the right-hand side so that uh, the left back would concentrate merely on dock and forget about going forward. So there was a number of little small issues that, that, we, that we tinkered with uh, in our game plan. And then obviously the goals were brilliant. I mean, uh, the one that hurt them the most was Sean, uh, Sean's volley just after half time. And I think that sort of, then we knew we were all set on the game. But uh, I mean, then there was, I mean, Shoes' goal, uh, uh, you know, uh, unbelievable. And I also must, before I forget, I must also just pay tribute to uh, our, our fallen guys, you know, Cizwe, uh, Shoes, and, and Philemon, you know. You know, uh, we've lost three, three real, real good friends and players of the highest caliber. And uh, so it wouldn't be fitting if I didn't remember them uh, whenever I talk about uh, our triumph. True legends of the game um, and the success of the national team at that time was built on their spines, if I could use that term. Uh, real, real influential players who went on not only to play well in, in South Africa, but went into Europe. Mm -hmm. Turkey, Bari, uh, uh, Spain, you know, I can still remember Cizuem Dawung, man marking Ronaldo at the time, who was the child genius of the world and out marking the whole game. So, yes, you, we can never forget these legends. Neil, I presume you know what Netflix is? Yeah. A couple of years ago, I was speaking to Lucas Khadeva and I said, why haven't we made a documentary for Netflix? on the 1996 team. One, mm -hmm. your journey was incredible. Two, you guys are all charismatic characters. Yeah. Three, we have to honor people while they are living, not yeah. when they're gone. <laughs> and this is an opportunity to do that. And if I was able to get that Netflix documentary for you, what are one of the untold stories you'd be able to share on that? What is an anecdote um, that we might not know? It might be a superstitious moment in the change room or in camp, it might be a moment where yeah i can i can tell you a story that that i had with cloud barker i've got a long history back with cloud um where we he's a very very superstitious coach not that he relies on it but he he's a guy that that will if we want to match then you won't change the clothing you you know you wear the same clothing for for the next match he, you know you wouldn't deviate from it and so you try to keep a routine that was going. So, leading into the first match against Cameroon, 
uh, in the tournament, we we had our we had our um, uh, pre-match or well, our breakfast that morning, coming into the into the pre-match, and um, and Club had this uncanny knack of riding on his chair like like he was a school kid, you know, sitting back and riding on the chair, and and he was next to me and. And I said, no, Club, you can't act like a school kid. And, you know, you're the coach of the team. And, you know, jokingly, and, and, and said, you're the coach of the team. And, you know, he says, Neil, man, it's just nerves. It's just nerves. So I said, OK, well, we'll have to sort out your nerves, you know. And I picked up a spoon and I hit him on his max. <laughs> so I obviously he cringed. And then um, <laughs> and the history is, is then told that we won 3-0, you know. So now, club being one of of extreme uh, routine and and didn't like ways to change, came against Angola. He did the same thing. He came down and just I don't think whether he thought about it or whatever. Sat next to me and you know, talking, and a couple of minutes later, he rode on the back of his chair again, and I let him have it again with the spoon. You are cruel. <laughs> And uh, he was cringing and that. So now he pick up six points against um, and, 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 and qualified for the group stage now. So I don't know if his thinking was that are you not going to catch me again uh, against Egypt? And, and as you know, we lost to Egypt. So, <laughs> so he had to bite the bullet for the next couple of games where I hit his, I hit his balls harder and the balls became bluer and bluer and bluer. <laughs> oh, and we're going to talk about so, but he accepted it for, for the pain for the gain, for no pain for the for the gain. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I think honestly, if there was ever anybody who captured um, a documentary on that, I think it would be fascinating. Yeah. Not just for people in the country, but around the world, because it was such an interesting time where we were in South Africa in that moment. I'll probably in class age now, I'll probably kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, well, listen, but, you know, uh, just moving on and you, you've spoken about history, expectation, uh, success. Let's look at our current Bafana setup at the moment, Neil. What is, in your opinion, the problem that we are falling so far off being successful on a similar level? I think you, tipped on, you touched on it a little bit early, earlier where you mention all those players playing in Serie A, um, you know, this, uh, this, the Spanish League, the English Premiership. Uh, you know, we had a number of players playing overseas in top leagues, top teams, and playing their trade. Even if it was in, 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 in Sweden, Norway, wherever, uh, in the States, in in the championship, if you can term it that in, in, in England as well. Um, and you can't take away that competition level that they were, that they were achieving week in, week out. Uh, given the fact that I believe also the competition level now in a premiership here local was also higher then, um, you know, uh, I just, it just, uh, that's, so the competitiveness and for up now players are, are earning loads and loads of money here locally and, and rightly so. I'm not saying that, that it's not right to do that. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's good. It's good where the game's gone like that. But I think there's that comfort zone where they are now content just to, to sit back and earn the money and not work as hard as I maybe should do to improve their game uh, continuously. And you just have to see the likes of uh, Percy Tao, how he's improved as a player uh, by his move overseas. And there's a load more that should be overseas that, and some that do get overseas, but are back, are back in a flash, you know, and not trying to ride out the difficulty of, of it overseas. Well, the Pafana conundrum continues. Um, we hope with the new coach coming in that we start to to see different elements of success. Um, 
but I did see that you were involved with SAFA in 2020 on a technical level. Is that what you are still, are you still involved with them? Or are you still involved in that setup? No, uh, I was contracted them to them for five years as a technical director from 2015 to 2020, June. And uh, I fulfilled that role. Um, uh, and then obviously COVID came and then, so I, we were at home, my contract was over and, and you know, I've been traveling for a long time in my life and I th felt that uh, I, I, I'd done enough. Um, organization is going through challenging times uh, caused by COVID and by other factors, outside factors in terms of getting sponsorship and, and, and stuff like that. So the programs that I'd set up uh, uh, in 2018 and or 2018, 2019 and 1920 uh, for the technical directors to be placed in, in each province, which I had done. And then that was disbanded. Uh, so, you know, those those were crucial elements to say that, look, you know, uh, if I do something, I do it correctly, I do it properly. And I don't think SAFA in my eyes could have maintained the level of where we wanted to go. It was just ticking over, just starting nicely um yes a lot of people would say that this wasn't done that wasn't done they didn't really know the background behind it where the platforms that we had set up in all the different areas um CAF were going through also challenging times with their coaching licenses um where they wanted to get it uniform throughout the continent and not some countries uh, doing an a license in 30 days like ourselves and some other countries doing it in 10 days. And so, so they went through the, those processes and were busy with those processes, but it was taking time for the change. But I think it, it will come for the better, eventually streamlining it, putting it on, on one database. So that will come. So, but there was, it was being delayed and delayed. So, but anyway, it wasn't because of the hardships there, it was just, I felt that it was now time to come back to Durban and uh, I've been traveling 40 odd years every single week, week in, week out. And I thought it was time now just to come back and have a sabbatical. Hi you know. when you look at Kaiser Chiefs, I mean, this is arguably the most powerful football brand on the African continent. You see yeah. people wearing jerseys all over the world. Um, similarly to Alakhli, another great brand, Zamalek from, um, from Egypt. And I look at the way that we've seen some of the top clubs run around the world. And the Mutongs have obviously synonymous with, with Kaiser Chiefs. Um, do you think that the current leadership model that Kaiser Chiefs have in place is in line with perhaps a, with some of the best clubs and how they're run on the continent and around the world? Is that family structure behind it still the best way to go? Or would it be better maybe having a more distanced approach and having other people make the, the football decisions? Yeah, I think it's, it's a, it's a catch-22 situation where the family really, really loves the, the brand, loves the team. It's, it's been made by the, their father and, 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 and namely Kaza has put in years and years and years of hard work to get it where it is. And as you say, it's a hell of a brand. It's a beautiful brand. Um, coming back to your, your question, I think that football should be left to football people. If I can call it, I'm not saying that, that there's no football people, no. I just think there's technical issues and there's the brand and there's the, the, um, the other areas which are which Chiefs leaves every other team in South Africa really wanting, you know. They, they are the best. They, they set up their training facilities, their, their, their club uh, support base. So they have a wonderful, wonderful area uh, uh, of 
opportunity in all aspects because of the brand. I just think, and it, I think it's told a story and I wouldn't be saying anything out of tune and I'm not saying it in a derogatory uh, that the results of the last six years have said it for themselves. You know, I think a freshen up of technical surroundings is needed for, for chiefs to, to now gain momentum again, you know, and get the support where it's needed. Because if you get that chiefs juggernaut back on track, winning games week in, week out, just oh, where can that club be? I mean, it's up there with the Manchester cities, the, the Man United, the Liverpools, the Real Madrid's, the Barcelona's in terms of, 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 a, of a club nature, you know, and is rivaled by no one in, the, in South Africa. Absolutely no one, even Sundowns. Sundowns have got a lot to learn uh, with regards to, to Chiefs and, and how they've done things. Although Patrice has really, really given them the momentum and given them the ability to, to progress technically. And that, that might be an opportunity to see where you look at the two different models where Patrice has definitely got his, his technical areas uh, spot on with the support systems and the technical areas. And I think that's, if anything, that's where Chiefs uh, uh, needs as well. But there's definitely a role for the whole family because they are passionate, they are loving, they love the brand, they love the club. It just needs to be done in the right percentages. So I've got a Chiefs jersey, number 20, as Neil would know, the Freeze family, number 20. So I wore to training the one day at my over 45s uh, team that I trained with. And, 20 uh, years ago. <laughs> well said, Neil. You know the man's life. <laughs> and uh, one of the guys says to me, because I'm here in Essex, one of the guys says to me, oh, so you also follow the band Kaiser Chiefs. Honestly, I had to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I said, mate, before it was a band, it was a team. Oh, I've never heard of them. <laughs> Get an education, son. I, I was embarrassed. You should, have should have started singing. <laughs> I, was, I was just embarrassed, I tell you. Sorry, Zach, go ahead. No, 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 it's all good. It's all good. Um, Neil, we, we spoke to Matthew Booth on this podcast um, earlier this year. And um, one of the things he was saying to us was that Sundowns really started to achieve success on the field when they left Pizzo Mosemani to start to make the decisions where Patrice became more hands-off and empowered his, his coaches, empowered his technical team. And, you know, the dynasty speaks for itself of, of, of what they've built. Um, if you were given the dream job of um, looking after Kaiser Chiefs and making those decisions and bringing in your own, you know, director of football, coaches, um, etc. If I gave you that role, who would you, br who would you bring in? Who would you look to? Would it be international? Would it be local? Um, would it be a combination? I'm, I'm interested to see how you would think about building it. And maybe if you don't want to name names, you can name the type of skill sets you'd be looking for. Yeah, I think, I think they started that and I think they've realized that. So what I was talking about a little bit earlier, they brought in, uh, brought in Malifi Nseki as the as so-called technical director of the club. Um, uh, so I'm sure Malifi will, will look at all those different aspects of, and, and one of them has got to be their scouting, their scouting network. Uh, is, you know, before Chiefs from the whole, all over the country and you think, where did he come from? And, and that's just from word of mouth in the different areas. And suddenly that, that player was at Chiefs and say, Chiefs, where did he come from? And he becomes a star. So I think there's one area where, where Sundowns have been so, so effective is they, they've got guys in all the, in all the regions and, 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 and provinces that are looking at players constantly in an, every single weekend. And, and getting reference and not just looking at them once or twice. They, they spend a lot of money in that scouting regime. And I think you can use a lot of the ex-Chiefs players to do that because then the players, Kaiser Chiefs player will, will know what type of player is, is required and needed, you know? 
and and that'll also help with the with, with the legends of chiefs you know so that's one area that i believe can can really really get them through because i think it's difficult to say well you need another assistant coach or this or whatever because those areas they've got they've got good people undoubtedly now it comes down to the player which player are they recruiting how are they recruiting so that for that for me would be the biggest change i would implement in in chiefs uh, the, the the junior setup is very 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 good although i would then get a lot of those coaches take them overseas to other other clubs man city have a wonderful youth uh, youth um, uh, setup you know just not only from the setup sorry but how they do their their coaches the coaching situation um and a lot of those clubs overseas and and you know and and, and see how they do it and what skills they are now adding to it although as you say man and uh, man city are, are are very big buyers but they still have those uh, the the young youngsters coming through every now and again so they've got a wonderful setup which you'll see a lot more youngsters coming through in the future one last question from me and neil and i'm sure courtney will come in uh, but i noticed you said nobody rivals kaiser chiefs you referenced sundowns you didn't mention the other um soweto giants um, do you think the Orlando Pirates brand is one that is probably second to Chiefs, or do you think Sundowns have surpassed them now? Yeah, they are. Um, obviously, Pirates is a huge brand. You know, I was talking a lot of the case really from a technical perspective as well, and I think Pirates have to do the same what Chiefs have done, because Sundowns is leaving Pirates and Chiefs standing in terms of their, their technical performance. You know, on the field and and. And I think that's that's both those clubs have to say, okay, let's look back and say, why aren't we we winning more trophies? Uh, why are Sundowns winning all the trophies? And and because obviously the brands are support surpass Sundowns brand by leaps and bounds, both of them do. So yeah, it's uh, the technical performance. And once you get the technical performance, then that even makes your brand even grow. Uh, exponentially. Neil, I've just, uh, my question just actually comes off something you said a bit earlier. You said in management, um, this is what I would be doing. This is how I would be empowering the team at the moment. Um, I just, I just feel that then you become a loss, especially to a team like Chiefs that needs this direction. Now you have mentioned a bit about management are you not looking to go back into it or, or are you thinking you're going to take a sabbatical and then give it a go a bit later on? What are your thoughts, may I ask? Well, at this moment, um, I'm enjoying the, the, the laugh I have at the moment. Uh, you, you can never say I'm going to be lost to, to football. Um, uh, I have spoken to, to Amazulu because obviously I live in Durban uh, and what Kaiser Chiefs have done with their village uh, and their technical center, I would love to do for, for Amazulu and they've shown interest. So at this moment, I'm just waiting for them to come back to me if they're serious enough with it, because if I'm not gonna do it, I'm gonna do it properly. I'm not gonna give any second measures. So uh, it would be really nice to consult to Amazulu uh, in that regard of acquiring premises, putting the offices there, putting the, the fields, you know, getting the field set up with the gymnasium, with the, um, with the change room, with, with, with all that goes with a technical center, high performance technical center from physio rooms, doctor's rooms, swimming pools, gymnasiums, um, indoor facilities, and then having the having six-year-olds play in the leagues uh, under the Amazulu banner, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 different age groups playing, wanting to, to play for the senior team. So that whole makeshift of high performance, uh, 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 I'd love to do for them on a consulting basis. So that's where I would probably gear around to at this moment, because I, 
I learned a lot as a technical director. So, you know, with FIFA and in 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 CAF. So uh, I sort of feel I'm in that sort of looking. In, um, I'm in that top. Just um, and and something that, as we know, as an Italians, the the lure of uh, the Joburg teams, and we can't lose our talent. So I think that setup and where you'd like to go would really be beneficial because we start to keep our local talent in the province, which then strengthens our current teams like uh, Amazulu, the Golden Arrows, that they are to be better. So I really hope you get the go ahead with that. Well, Mr. Neil Tovey, we just want to say thank you very much today for taking the time to sit down with us. Uh, with your patience, your time, your memories that you shared during your legendary career, we are just very, very grateful. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Neil. Thank you.